Uh, yeah, morning everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks Francesca. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we have a very tight program. So my job here is really uh, very small. It's just to officially open uh, the fifth uh, SIAB uh, annual student symposium. Uh, and uh, so I would want to welcome you all who are here present and also those uh, who are joining us online. Um, so this is one of our um, uh, highlight events for SIAB that gives the students an opportunity to share the, you know, the exciting research findings with the broader, you know, Makanda community. And now with the virtual platforms, we can reach really the, the, the broader global community as well. Um, so we have a broad range of talks, uh, very exciting talks ranging from taxonomy, systematics, uh, telemetry, um, uh, fisheries, marine spatial planning, conservation ecology, and also the use of uh, uh, nature-based solutions to enhance biodiversity in transformed uh, uh, habitats. So I looked also at the keynote speakers, very interesting there. There's a nice transition you can see, you know, from the not so young to the not so old. So this highlights, you know, a good progression uh, in the future of the research that we are doing uh, in, in South Africa and also within, uh, within our continent. So to the presenters, uh, this is your moment to shine. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. And I usually don't have notes for conferences, but um, I'm the one who has to give a series of thank yous. So I just got my notes down. Thank you, Albert, for this welcoming. This is our fourth annual symposium, uh, student symposium event. And because it's live, we're also very grateful to have our uh, colleagues from the Northwest University. And I hope you enjoyed um, a productive uh, week at SIA. Um, so going with the thanks, I think, don't know, these lights are really blinding me, but um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, the team, uh, our tremendous organizing team. I don't know who's in the house, but I think you guys have to stand because you did the job while I was away. So I, um, please, cost people, where are you? Cost people, they're not even here. <laughs> yes. So, and there is a team, basically, some of, that, some of us are joining us online. Carrie Ann um, is joining us from Ascension Island and she's part of the organizing team. This is like, uh, dedicating a uh, hard work, people filled with passion, creativity, new ideas. You're going to see them through the uh, through the day and enthusiasm. And a special thank to Carrie Ann again and Nokubonga because they really did a screening of all of the abstract. They were chasing people back and forth, always with a smile. You can't see a smile on the email, but trust me, uh, if I was writing those emails, they wouldn't be those uh, that polite at times. So um, I also want to thank numerous individuals. I'm not going to say the names. I'm just going to link to the thanking for the bookings, for the catering, for the communication behind all of this amazing advertising, the printing, and quite a lot of interns who have dedicated their time today. Um, a shout out to the uh, our host here, the Amazwi um, South African Museum Literature. I, I think you all agree that this is a beautiful uh, venue. And also, if I'm speaking on the mic, and I know there are people online and everything, need to thank the technical team from the National Art, um, Art Festival for their support in managing all of these. Um, my appreciation ex extends to the keynote speakers. I've had the pleasure to work with both of them. And it really, what Albert said, from um, highlighting from a uh, uh, very pillar science for South Africa and the world and into the new generation of science. So I'm excited to hear uh, from them. And of course, a big thank you to all of the presenters. Some are online, pre-recorded some, but most of them are back live. And this is really an exciting uh, time. And of course, all of the steady support by the hard work supervisors. Uh, before some little practical announcement though, I want to also, just take a pause and invite everyone to reflect as tomorrow we are approaching the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. It's the 25th of November. It's a global celebration. And I'm not sure if there's much to celebrate with nine women being killed in South Africa every day. So as scientists, we also need to step back and we are humans and, and we cannot detach ourselves from this reality and maybe remind ourselves that our daily behavior can also make a difference. Um, 
so now for some housekeeping, uh, the program is specced. You heard from, and I'm here talking still, um, from Albert that we really have a tight program. So I urge all you speakers and we, we in, the chairs are instructed to be ruthless. So to, to stick to the schedule, but also to encourage the audience in engaging with the students and ask for questions. We've introduced this year a Plika session. Vuyo will give you some in, in instructions just at the end of this, just before tea time. And so listen carefully to all of the talks because there's something exciting. And um, at the end of the day, there's also uh, a voting for the best MSc and the best uh, PhD presentation. So um, we're gonna give been given further links and instruction to to vote. But without further any further um, ado, let's kick off the the symposium. And I'm just inviting here on stage uh, Professor Christopher McQuaid, who is your our first keynote speakers. And please help me to welcome him. Okay, Christopher, I'm just gonna give. I'm just going to give a brief presentation, if it can be summarized in, in a short, taking the, 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 the theme of this symposium, the tides are changing, and we want to reflect on this shift of science from yesterday to today. I don't think we got a better example in South Africa, but also for the global marine science, as Christopher represents, I think, a true pillar of, of this. So I'm just going to give you a, a, bit, a bit of a background of his biography. He, Christopher was uh, born in Northern Ireland and received his PhD in zoology at UCT in Cape Town. He worked as a chief scientific officer aboard the expedition ship Benjamin Bowring for two years and during a, a polar circumnavigation of the world with the Transglobe expedition. Then he was a lecturer in zoology and an entomology at Rhodes University after doing a postdoc at UCT. He was appointed chair of zoology in 1991. Then he moved to department, um, head, head of the department of the zoology and entomology. And he was also the director of the Southern Ocean Group at Rhodes University for 20 years. He was appointed Saatchi chair in marine ecosystem research at Rhodes in 2008 and was promoted um, to distinguish professor in 2011. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa, a member of the Zoological Society of Southern Africa and of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. I'm not finished. He, he was visiting, um, uh, he was a visiting research uh, professor at the University of Hong Kong for three years. And during two one year sabbatical, he was a Sir Kirby, Kirby Lane, Kirby? Kabilang Fellow at the University of Wales and visiting professor at the University of St. Andrews. His academic awards include Rhodes University Junior and Senior Research Award, an NRF A rating, excuse me, a Harry Oppenheimer Fellowship, the Gilchrist Medal for Contribution to Marine Science, the Gold Medal of the Zoological Society, and an Oppenheimer Memorial Trust Award. He's married with three children, he's a grandpa, he played hockey for Ireland, and he holds uh, black belt in Aikido, so watch out, guys. And he already told me that it's going to be a little bit uh, over time. So without any further ado, I just want to welcome Christopher on stage. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, when Francesca asked me to give this talk, she thought I might like to go through the various milestones in my career. I thought it might be a bit more useful to talk about how I got into science, uh, why, I'm, why I'm in science, and what it means to have a life in science. So if you are a person of my generation, and you're in marine biology, people assume that you were inspired by this man. This man is a, a French person called Jacques Cousteau, and he, he came to fame by sailing around the world in a yacht called the Calypso. And he took a team of divers and they dived to wonderful, interesting places, the Caribbean, the Red Sea, all over the place. And he was really one of the first people to popularize interest in marine science in, in the world. He's sort of like a precursor of David Attenborough in a sense. Um, so he's a very inspiring character because think about it. You can live on a yacht, sail around the world, dive in interesting places, drink lots of red wine, and cultivate a French accent, which they tell me is good for attracting ladies. 
Uh, but in fact, I wasn't inspired by Jacques Cousteau. I really wanted to work originally on the animals in the top left there, and these are ants. These are called cocktail ants. They're not called cocktail ants because they're salted and you eat them while you're having a martini. They're called cocktail ants because when they get agitated, they cock their tail up over the thorax and they exude a blob of pheromone, which gets all the other ants excited. And I was interested in ants because as individuals, they're incredibly simple. If you think about it, an ant is in essence, one ganglion with six legs, but collectively they do incredibly interesting things. They form societies, they build nests, they can grow their own food, they can farm other insects. They do lots of really very, very clever things. So I thought these were really interesting animals. I really was keen to work on them, but nobody was keen to supervise a project on ants. So, a project came up, which was on these animals, the Himalayan tars. These are wild goats that come from the Himalayas. And a couple of those escaped from the zoo in Cape Town, and they started breeding on Table Mountain. And there was a project to look at their ecological effects on Table Mountain. But unfortunately, there wasn't any funding. So at the end of the day, I ended up doing a project on marine biology because there was a project and there was some funding. And so I found myself in this sort of situation and I put this slide up for two reasons. The first is those little, little snowdrop thingies are to remind myself that it was actually snowing on that day. And there's a message in that. The message is, if you need the data and it's snowing, well, dress warmly. If you need the data and it's 40 degrees, well, wear some sunscreen. If, if you need the data, you need the data, you go out and get them. And the point here is that science is not necessarily easy. You, you have to be serious about it. You have to be dedicated. You have to do what it takes to get the information that you need. The second message here is if you look at the equipment I'm using, I appear to have a rock and a chisel and some sort of a quadrat. And there's an important message in that as well. And it's that the technology is not what's important. What is important is the questions that you ask. I have nothing against technology. You need very highly advanced technology to answer a whole lot of questions. It gives us insight into things that would otherwise not be possible to understand. But you mustn't become enamored of technology. You can do really bad science with very high tech, and you can do really good science with very simple technologies. So for example, this was part of my PhD, which at the end of the day produced nine papers. So I produced nine papers with a rock and a chisel and a quadrat. You can use technology, but don't depend on it exclusively. So after the PhD, I worked for a while on an estuary. This is the Bot River estuary, which is close to Cape Town. And that introduced me to a whole different set of animals. Um, not only animals, but plants as well. And it was because it was a, an estuary which was closed at the time it was flooded, most of that work was underwater. So I was working with different systems, different ecologies, different organisms. After that, I got, as, as um, Francesca said, I got a position as a scientist on this ship, which is called the Benjamin Bowring, and it was part of the Transglobe expedition. <clears throat> and again, there's an important message in this. The ship was doing a polar circumnavigation of the globe. It arrived in Cape Town. They wanted to take some scientists down to the Antarctic. Did anybody want to go? So everybody put their hand up. And then they said, well, we're sailing on Thursday. And everybody said, well, I'm washing my hair on Thursday, or I have to feed my dog. I can't, I can't possibly go. So everybody fell away. I didn't. I took, I took the opportunity. When opportunities come, you should grab them with both hands, and they can lead on to all sorts of other things. I'm, I'm sure that you're wondering what the polar circumnavigation of the globe is. And the answer is it's sailing around the world, not this way, which is what we would normally expect, but this way. So the ship went London, South Pole, North Pole, London. And that took about two years. Well, I was on for about two years. It took actually about three years. And the inset there, you can see it was it had a patron. Um, that's the, the, the deck of the ship. And the man at the wheel is the patron. Some of you may recognize him. He is now um, King Charles III of England. At that stage, he was just Prince Charles. So, the Transloop expedition, as you can imagine, took us to some extraordinary places. It took us to the Antarctic, where there were lots of penguins. It took us to the Arctic, where there were lots of polar bears. 
And hopefully, as biologists, you know the answer to the question of why don't polar bears eat penguins? You know, they live at other ends of the world. It's amazing how many people don't realize that. So after the Translobe expedition, I did a postdoc for a while in Cape Town, produced my favorite paper that I've ever written. Um, it was on rock lobsters and whelks. And then I took a job at Rhodes University, where leaders learn, they tell me. And I was employed by this man, who was Professor Brian Allenson, who had been professor at that stage for longer than I had been alive. And in fact, probably I was professor at Rhodes for longer than most of you have been alive, I realized. And he was an extraordinary man whom I always likened to Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was a Greek emperor who created an empire that went all the way from Greece to India. And when he died of malaria in Babylon in 323 BC, his empire was so big that his, his generals couldn't run it on their own. They had to divide it up amongst themselves. So one took Persia, one took Egypt, and so on. So Cleopatra, queen of Egypt, was actually of Greek descent, descended from one of Alexander's generals. So about two or 3,000 years later, when Brian Allison retired, it took three people to take up his job. One person became the head of the Department of Zoology and Entomology. One became the director of the Institute for Water Research, which Brian Allison created out of thin air. And one became director of the Southern Ocean Group, which Brian Allenson created out of thin air. So he was an incredibly productive man. I was the one who took over the Southern Ocean Group. And we then did a lot of work, some again in the Antarctic, but also uh, mostly around Marion Island. And that introduced us again to completely different ecosystems than any I'd ever worked on before. So it introduced me to wonderful animals like the albatross chicks up there, the king penguins, the orcas, but it also sometimes puts you in perilous situations. That's me trying to catch a, an albatross chick so I could take some of its blood and look at its stable isotope composition. And Marion Island is really interesting because it has some of the largest penguin rookeries on the planet. And every summer, there are about eight or 10 million animals that come there to breed and to, uh, to molt in the case of the seabirds. And we were very interested in how it would, that was possible. So any of you who have children will know that breeding is incredibly expensive, both financially and energetically. And we knew that primary production on those islands could not possibly sustain that size of population of predators. And it took us about 10 or so years to work out the basis for the support of that ecosystem. So one way or another, I've been exposed to a lot of different ecosystems. I worked in organisms which were unicellular, are published on organisms that are unicellular, are published on organisms which are whales. And that, so the, my point there is that a, a, a career in science can be incredibly rewarding. It takes you to interesting places, it allows you to meet very interesting people, and it allows you to work on fascinating ecosystems. But there is a, a push these days to say, well, what, what is the point of science? And I have a slightly different take on that from probably from most people. For me, science, good science, is a hallmark of civilization. So whether it be Greek philosophy, Mayan astronomy, Arab mathematics, Roman engineering, I think all the great civilizations were characterized by strength in science. And I, I'm fully behind a statement which ex-president Thabo Mbeki once made, which is that this country should not aspire to be one which can clothe and feed itself. We should have higher aspirations. And I think that high, uh, good science, I think for me, is a hallmark of civilization in the way that high art is a hallmark of civilization. But of course, there are practical sides to it as well. So we had a COVID pandemic recently. And if you think about it, we had this strange disease which came from nowhere, it was killing a lot of people, and we came up with a vaccine really, really quickly. How was that possible? And the answer is it was possible because people had been studying vaccines and immunization for about 30 or 40 years before that. So the scientific basis for that response was already in existence. So there is a practical side to science as well. It's also important to recognize that we are entirely dependent on nature. We are just another species on the planet. And this is brought out very nicely in the book by an American ecologist called Jared Diamond called Collapse. And that describes how civilizations in the past have actually destroyed the ecosystems on which they depended and subsequently collapsed. And he uses examples from um, Easter Island. He uses an example. One could also think about 
um, the dust bowls in Oklahoma in the 1930s, when overgrazing caused the, the whole ecosystem to collapse. So suddenly you can't grow enough food to sustain yourself. And we might think of, are we doing something like that today? And you might like to think about global climate change in that sort of context. Are we undermining the ecosystems on which we depend? And Diamond emphasized this with his, his subtitle, how societies choose to destroy themselves, essentially is what he's saying. And of course, to, to avoid that sort of situation, we need to keep nature in some sort of state of balance. We need to keep our ecosystems in a healthy state. How do we do that? We can only do that by understanding how they function. So for me, that's the function of ecology. One of the functions of ecology is to understand how ecosystems exist and how they stay in balance. Those of you who are doing theses, when you finished your PhD, Sipilele, wherever you are, um, when you finish your PhD, you then need to find a job or a postdoc. And how do you do that? Well, you, you apply for a postdoc. And I, I treat postdocs a little and think about postdocs a little bit differently from other people. A lot of people will have a project. I want to work on this. I know what needs to be done. I know how to do it. I need a pair of hands to do it. That's the postdoc. I think that's a terrible way to approach a postdoc. I think a postdoc is not an extra pair of hands. A, a postdoc is an extra brain. A postdoc is someone who comes to me and says, look, I've got this idea. What do you think? And I might say, no, that's a terrible idea. Let's do this instead. Or I might say, that's a brilliant idea. Let's explore it. But you may find yourself in a position where you get a postdoc and somebody says, this is the project. This is how it needs to go. That, that's fine. That's not the end of the world. But don't think that you're just a pair of hands. You should take that idea and you should expand it. You should explore it. You should say, yes, but suppose we do this as well. How about if we do that differently? You should, in other words, you should contribute. And the key to that is think. Always think. Think about what you're doing. Don't just do it automatically. It's not a nine to five job. And that's really central to a career in science is you, you should always be asking questions. My favorite question is why? You should never stop asking questions. You should never stop learning. People are often afraid to ask questions. They think it's an indication of ignorance. And it is an indication of ignorance. But asking the question is also an indication that I don't know that and I want to know that. And that's, that's a very important attribute, I think. So if, I don't know, if I use vocabulary, like I use the word oxymoron, and nobody knows what the word oxymoron is, I expect to be asked. How many of you know what oxymoron means? The rest of you should be asking me. If you get into science, uh, as Lyle has at early stage in his career, he's lucky. He's already been exposed to a number of different ecosystems. It's important in your research to search for generality. So I could work on barnacles at Kenton, and nobody cares about barnacles in Kenton except the people who live in Kenton. So search for generality in your research. So here is photographs of three shores. There's a South African shore here. There's, um, sorry, I beg your pardon. There's a Hong Kong shore, uh, which Lyle might recognize actually. And there's one from the UK. And you'll see that they all look very, very different. So the work that I do on a rocky shore in South Africa, does it apply to shores in Hong Kong and England? Does it have generality. And that, that's really important. Otherwise, you're becoming very, very specific. And that's a photograph of Nibia just because I thought it looked pretty. Um, when you go to different places, you'll find that sometimes they look extremely different from each other. So here is a photograph I took in Oman and another photograph which I took in Argentina. And the one in Argentina, is, to me, is absolutely extraordinary because it was a penguin rookery on the coast in Argentina. And those are penguin fledglings, and they're mingled with armadillos. And I have a photograph which has armadillos and penguins and llamas all in the same frame. So sometimes things look really, really different from what you're used to. And the question is, the science which you produce, does it apply to those other systems, or is it very specific to the system that you've worked on? On other occasions, things look very similar. Here's a lady collecting mussels in Transkai. Here's another lady collecting mussels in Morocco. They're actually collecting the same species of mussel. Why do those systems look the same? Do they look the same? Actually, they don't really. If you look at the background, coralline algae, mussel bed. The only reason the trans sky looks like that is that it went from this 
to that because of a rehabilitation program. So that's some of the application of, of science which you can do. If you're going to be a scientist, uh, it's, it's worth listening to the advice of older people sometimes, believe it or not. Um, I, a senior colleague once said to me, if you're going to be a scientist, you can work on your own, you can do very good science, but people who collaborate, people who collaborate tend to be more effective. By collaborating, you're working with other people. They have different ideas, they think differently, they have different skills, and those can complement your skills. And if that's the case, you need to be careful about who you collaborate with. You don't want to collaborate with the woman who takes your draft manuscript, sits in it for three months, and sends it back with two spelling corrections. That, that's of no benefit to you at all. They can be your best friend and remain your best friend, but you don't necessarily want to collaborate with them. You want the person who gets the paper, goes through it, thinks about it carefully, adds to it, contributes to it, and sends it back quickly. I, I like to think of an analogy with table tennis. So something arrives on my desk, it's just gonna sit there, bang, I send it back again. Lyle, I hope you're listening. Bang, you send it back again. My turnaround time ideally is two or three days. A week is good. But that's not just sending it back with spelling corrections, that's having sat down and thought about it carefully. So it sits with a whole lot of other things on your desk and you have to look at the other things and say, are they more important? than getting this science published. And if the answer is no, then you need to return that quite quickly. And I can take this sometimes to quite extremes. This, this was me returning Alberto's chapter. I'm going to go back to the idea that the question is what's important. And this, again, was a piece of advice that a senior colleague gave me. He said, think about the question you want to address and approach it using an animal that people eat. And the reason he said that is that if people eat it, it's easier to get funding. Simple as that. So I was at one point interested in working on larval dispersal. And barnacles are a really good system for studying larval dispersal. But people eat mussels. People cultivate mussels. So I decided instead to work on mussels. And sure enough, research funding was much, much easier to get than if I'd been working on barnacles. Slight change now. Um, some of you may have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg was a physicist in Germany in the 1920s. And he came up with this hypothesis that if you look at very small things like an electron, the more you know about where it is, the less you know about where it's going to be. In other words, it's momentum, it's direction of movement and it's speed of movement. And I always like to think of that as at the back of your head, always be aware that Whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is that you think, you may be wrong. It's very important to recognize that you may be wrong. It's also very important in science to recognize the importance of competing hypotheses. And those are two explanations for the same thing. So I see a phenomenon and I say, oh, it's because of A, but it could actually also be because of B. Those are competing hypotheses. And how do you separate between those two hypotheses? And the answer is an experiment. And a good experiment will say it's A or it's B. A bad experiment will say, well, it could be, could be either. So a good experiment will say yes or no. It won't say maybe. So when you're designing an experiment, ask yourself, is it possible for this experiment to produce the answer maybe? If, if it can, then it's a bad experiment. Rethink it, design a different experiment. So again, Always at the back of my head is the, the idea, think, you have to keep thinking. So I'll give you an example of competing hypotheses. There are no palm trees in the Arctic. Why are there no palm trees in the Arctic? I'm asking you. Anybody have a suggestion? Temperature, it's too cold. What is the Antarctic? The Antarctic is a continent covered by ice. What is the Arctic? The Arctic is an ocean covered by ice. My competing hypothesis is that there's no soil in the Arctic. So simplistic, silly example, but it shows you how you have to design an experiment which will say it's either temperature or it's the absence of soil. And a well-designed experiment will do that. A badly designed experiment will say it could be either. 
All right, having got your PhD, having done a PH, having done a postdoc, you're now trying to get a job. I'm sitting here, I have a job, I have two candidates. How do I decide which candidate I should appoint? So I would ask you then, what, what currency does science use? And the, the bizarre thing about universities is that you apply for, for a lecturing position. Nobody asks you if you can lecture well. They ask you how many papers you have. They want to know if you're a good researcher. How do you prove that you're a good researcher? And the answer is track record. Think of it as horse racing. How do you choose the horse to put your money on? It's track record. How well has it done in the past? That's a good predictor of how well it's going to do in the future. So bear that in mind that when you're applying for a position, people are gonna say, what evidence do I have that this person will be a good researcher? It's an incredibly rewarding job. It's not a soft option. You have got to be very serious about it. You've got to take it seriously. You've got to think all the time and you've got to be dedicated. If you decide that that's, you know what, that's actually not for me, I think that's absolutely fine. You might get to the end of your PhD and say, well, that was a bit torrid. I'm going to go and become an accountant. And I see absolutely no problem with that. And in fact, in, in my own case, I found the job very stressful at first. And I said to my, I made myself a promise. I said, if this job ever gets too stressful, I will become a carpenter. At the end of the day, I didn't. Um, but I think it's very important to be realistic about this. If, if the job is not for you, don't do it. It's really not necessary. You can do other things. You can do science up to the PhD level or even a postdoc level, then decide, no, I want to do something different. If you do decide that it's for you and you want to stay in science, you must recognize that it's very competitive. You have to give everything to it. You have to really go all out and you have to realize that at the end of the day, when you walk away with your PhD, when you're three or four really nice papers, you're competing with McQuaid who had nine damn papers. How do you do that? When I applied for the job of um, chair of zoology at Rhodes University, there were applications from people in 12 different countries. It's a very competitive field. You have, to, you have to recognize that. And you can deal with it, but you just have to recognize that it's not necessarily going to be a walk in the park. But to give you hope, getting a job is like hitchhiking. I used to do a lot of hitchhiking when I was young. I hitchhiked in Namibia, Zimbabwe, Lesotho. I hitchhiked in New Zealand, in Canada, in Europe. I did a lot of hitchhiking and hitchhiking is a very frustrating thing because you stand there and all these cars go past. You apply for the job and you don't get it. You apply for the next job and you don't get it. You apply for the third job and you don't get it. But the key to hitchhiking is that at the end of the day, you only need one. You only need one job and that job can lead you to an incredibly rewarding career. Thank you. Christopher, how inspiring. Um, I guess we have time for a couple of questions. I don't, I haven't even looked at the time. I was just mesmerized and I was listening. So uh, we've got time for a couple of lessons. I've got lights here, so I'm not sure, but we've got two people with microphones going around. So can you just raise your hand if you want to ask Christopher a question? Can't see. I've got a question. Um, it's divided in two. If you had to go back, Christopher, something that you would not change at all. I know sometimes it's luck as well, so some things, some something you cannot change. But if if in your power or the, about the decisions that you made, something that you wouldn't change, and something perhaps that you think maybe I could have done something differently. I, I would definitely have taken the opportunity to go on the Translobe expedition. But no question that I would, it changed my whole life, um, including my career, because it led me then to things like becoming director of the Southern Ocean Group and so on. But also on a personal level, it's something I would never change. Um, it was also two years I spent with my wife, which was lovely. Um, in terms of what I would change, I, I might still go back and study ants. 
I, I really would. I, I really honestly think they're incredibly interesting organisms. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Lyle. Uh, can someone get a mic? Yeah. Right. Oh, no, because then people uh, online want to use it. Um, thank you so much for that very, very inspirational talk, Christopher. Um, and what a wonderful career. Um, I would just like to ask uh, two questions. One is, what has been the most rewarding experience of your career in science, inside and outside of South Africa? And number two, what has been your toughest challenge that you had to face um, coming into marine science in South Africa? Okay, top of my head. Um, sorry, say the first question again. The, was the, the first question is, what has been the most rewarding okay. experience? The, the, the most rewarding, I think, uh, there, are, there are a couple. I, possibly the most rewarding was the paper I did as a postdoc um, when I was in Cape Town. And I, I just the only paper I've ever had published in science. And it was just an incredibly, um, th there are two islands in, in Soldana Bay. One's got lots of crayfish and one doesn't have lots of crayfish. So we translocated them. And the one that doesn't have lots of crayfish had lots of whelks and the whelks then ate the crayfish. So that's a bit like the, the, the antelope started eating the lions. It was just the wrong way around. And it was just an incredibly interesting and exciting piece of work, which, which I really, really enjoyed. And then we, we took it a lot farther than that. And we worked out that it was to do with uh, a symbiosis between the whelks and um, I forgot, um, a bryozoan, which um, is distasteful to the rock lobsters. So the rock lobsters wouldn't eat the whelks, but the whelks would eat the rock lobsters. And so that was for me, the most rewarding, which is the most interesting piece of work. Um, the worst was probably when I was working with people. People are great to work with, but sometimes they can be really difficult. Uh, I was working at one point with some other people who were at Cape Town, um, and we were doing some work in the Southern Ocean, and uh, some new funding came up, and suddenly this extra group came into, into the thing, and it was like being in a swimming pool, and suddenly they, they let the sharks in. And it was fighting off other people who were pursuing the money, not the science. And, and they were very aggressively pursuing the money, and they were very good at it, but they weren't actually doing very good science. And that, to me, was, was disappointing that the system would allow that to happen, um, that people can bluff their way through um, and derail good science by, by hoarding the resources. So working with the wrong people is the short answer to that. Thank you so much. I'm sure and I hope students will take the most of, oh, we've got a, an online question from Pule. Can you please give advice to early career scientists on dealing with pressures that comes with academia and how to navigate them? Okay, we can spend here hours on that. Uh, Christopher? Um, okay, that's a really good question. Um, and that comes back to the idea of, you know, if you can't handle it, well, go and become a carpenter and that's absolutely fine. Um, but in terms of actually dealing with it, I think it's very important to compartmentalize. So. I was talking to Lyle earlier, who's feeling this sort of pressure. And the question is, how long is, how, how, how big is your job? How long is a piece of string? Uh, it's as big as you let it be. So what you need to do is to compartmentalize. So at some point you, you'll need to say to yourself, okay, Saturdays, Sundays, I do not work on Saturdays and Sundays. Now you might compensate by saying, okay, I'll work till six or seven if I have to. Um, but it's very important to set aside time, which is not part of the job. Um, I, I, I read a lot and as a student I found that I didn't have time to read and then one day I woke up and I thought if I don't have time to read now when will I ever have time to read so I just made time to read so somehow you can compartmentalize things one way I did it when I was head of department was I would say to people if the house is on fire you can come to me anytime if the house is not on fire please leave me alone until 11 o'clock so I gave myself two or three hours early in the morning, which I could devote to work. You can do the same sort of thing by saying, okay, after five o'clock, I'm going to go and play tennis or ride a horse or go for a walk or whatever it is you do. But the best way is to compartmentalize your work and also 
realize that not everything has to be done immediately. Things are not always, they, they always sound urgent, but they're not necessarily urgent. And learn to recognize what's really important that it happens now and what can actually wait for a little bit. I hope that might help. I think there's another question. Was there another question from, yeah, over there? Uh, Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, my question is about early career researchers. So you mentioned how we should take advantage of any opportunities that come across um, our way as we start our careers. But at what point do you begin to make a definite path for yourself? Because if you're jumping on just about anything that comes your way, do you really then have a direction with your science? I, I think that's that's a good question because, and I'm in in many ways a really bad example of that because as I tried to demonstrate, I've worked on lots of very very different things, and there there are a couple of ways of becoming established as a scientist. One is to become the expert in whatever it is, anything. Um, I, I've never taken that path, and I haven't taken that path because of why I do science, and I'm just interested in nature. So I, I would be happy studying trees or ants or or marine or marine systems, but you're quite right. At some point, you people have to be able to say, ah, that guy he works on whatever it is. Um, so that that's just a balance, I think, that you 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 take advantage. So it, all right, if you have to make that sort of decision, then you take advantage of the opportunities which are going to push you in the right direction. So I took the advantage of going on a ship which was exposing me to studying completely different marine systems, working with plankton, which I'd never done before in my life. But I didn't take one which was working on Himalayan tars. So you say, okay, there are two opportunities. This one is in the right direction. This one is really exciting, but it's not in the right direction. You have to make that call sometimes. So in essence, use your common sense. Yeah, and I don't mean that flippantly. I mean that seriously, just use your common sense. You you know what's good and what's 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 tempting but not necessarily a good idea. Oops, sorry. Thank you so much. I think tea times and lunch times are good times. What I've forgotten about um, to tell everyone just now when I was introducing everything and thanking everyone, there is a very exciting side event going on on this side as you go out. Um, it's a sound postcard project uh, that we've been working together with the music and musicology uh, colleagues from Rhodes University. So take your time to explore that. It's an open event, open until the 8th of December. So sorry for this advert. Uh, I think let's just give another round of applause for Christopher. And then I think we've, we've got Tatiwa who's going to chair this first session for the morning. Um, so again, I think we're good on time. I'm very excited. Uh, but um, Keep it tight. <laughs>so that we can sustainably manage this system because it is valuable to local recreational and subsistence fisheries. And so that leads us to the primary aim of this research, which is to quantify the fish community 
and to understand how the environment influences the fish community composition in this system. And the specific questions that this research wanted to answer is which fish species are present and what is their relative abundance? Secondly, we wanna know the time at which these fish species occur in the estuary. So do they occur all year round or seasonally or infrequently? Thirdly, we wanted to know the location of these fish species in relation to the estuary mouth. So do they occur only at the lower region of the estuary where the conditions are more saline? like in the ocean, or do they also occur further up the estuary where there's more fresh water or river input? And then lastly, we wanted to know which environmental parameters is, for example, temperature and tide that influence their fish community composition in the system. So the method of baited remote underwater video system, in short, graphs was utilized to observe and identify the fish in this system. And basically the, our graphs uh, consist of one go camera, one go camera that is mounted on one end of the rig. And then on the other end is a bait bag, which is to attract the fish to the camera view. And basically the graphs were deployed across the three sampling sites on a weekly basis over a two year period. And this was so that we could get uh, sufficient samples over a wide range of environmental conditions so that we could get a sound uh, and a complete understanding of what exactly influences the community composition in the system. And prior to the BRAVs being deployed in the sampling site, we also collected environmental parameters such as water temperature, water depth, uh, as well as the tidal stage. So this research managed to successfully, successfully deploy a total of 239 BRAVs, uh, and from those graphs, we managed to identify a total of 33 fish species, which belong to 17 families. And basically this plot shows that the most observed family from the 239 graphs were these parrots, which are marked by the red bars. I also had further classified the fish species into groups uh, based on the extent to which they depend on estuaries during their life stages first group were estuarine dependent species and these were composed of eight species, two of which were estuarine species and these are entirely dependent on estuaries during their life stages and they spend their entire life cycle in estuaries. And the other six species were marine species and these are known to utilize estuaries during the juvenile stage, which then indicates to us that the Kierbooms estuary likely serves as a nursery area for these marine fish species. Second group were marine estuarine opportunists, and these depend on estuaries at, at varying degrees. And a total of 11 fish species belonged to these groups, and these were some of the fish species that were encountered on our graph footages. Last group were the marine stranglers, which we did not expect to encounter in the system uh, because their appearance in estuaries is, is unusual. And interestingly, these were the most numerous fish species that were encountered in the system. So to answer the question of where these fish species were located along the estuary, basically this plot shows that some of the common species would only occur at the lower region of the estuary, which was site one. However, some species were more abundant further up the estuary, further up the estuary. And this plot shows that there were also seasonal changes in the relative abundance of the fish, but however, this was not consistent between species. And then a Palmer Nova results revealed that both the location of the sampling sites and the season significantly influenced the fish community in this system. So, we had also recorded temperature in the marine environment, which was located about 1.6 kilometers offshore the estuary mouth. And it was important to look at this marine temperature data in relation to the occurrence or abundance of the marine fish, especially the marine stranglers, so that we could get an insight on whether it's actually the cold ocean temperature that's triggering the migration of these marine stranglers into the system. And 
this research actually showed that this was actually the case. And this was supported by my two plots, my temperature plot, and the bottom corner is a generalized additive model plot. And basically what's happening there is during the first few months of the year, the abundance of the marine stranglers would be relatively higher, and that will coincide with the colder ocean temperature. And then from April up until September, when the ocean temperature becomes warmer, the abundance of these marine stranglers would decrease. And that's probably because they would have then migrated back into the ocean. And then during the remainder of the year, the abundance of these marine stranglers would then increase in the, in the estuary. And that's probably because it had become colder in the, in the, in the ocean. And so now from, from that, the conclusion is the Capums actually likely serves as an important habitat for these marine stranglers, which are seeking refuge in a relatively warmer, the relatively warmer waters of the system. And also the Capums estuary is one of the two permanently open systems between Cape St. Francis in Eastern Cape and Mossel Bay in Western Cape, which then highlights the importance of this system for these marine fish species. And at the beginning, I had mentioned that we wanted to investigate whether temperature and tide had an influence on the fish abundance or presence in the system. And for the marine stranglers, although tidal stage did contribute to the presence and abundance of these fish, however, it was temperature that had a it was temperature that was significantly important and this then leads to my last conclusion that environmental factors do not have equal importance some factors are more important than others and i'd like to thank the following people and institutions which made it possible for this research to be a success and i'd like to thank you all for listening okay uh we have time for uh, one question Um, this, this is a question from ignorance. Do bravs attract herbivorous fish? Pardon? Do bravs attract herbivorous fish? Not sure. Not sure. They do. So yeah, so my question was really what, what do you bait them with? Uh pilchards. Yeah. The herbivorous fish come to that. Huh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh thank you very much for the talk. Uh we'll be moving on. We are running a bit uh, behind time, two minutes behind time, so we'll try to catch up as we present. So the next talk is coming from uh, Chandra Leroux, and she'll be speaking on. They'll be speaking on the morphology and molecular characterization of four new species of Trypanosoma from fishes of the south coast of South Africa. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about blood parasites in marine and freshwater fish with um, supervisors Prof. Nico Smith, Prof. Courtney Cook, and Dr. Malish Streeter. So, just a brief introduction. Uh, Trypanosome is part of the genus Canetoplats, um, which is a unicellular parasitic flagellate protozoa, which requires a blood sucking invertebrate host to transfer from one host to another. Um, and they can infect from terrestrial animals to aquatic animals, um, and they have a very broad distribution range. Um, so marine fish is marine parasites is considered to be understudied as South Africa is one of the most biodiverse um, and diverse countries in the world. Um, and there's of, out of the 41 species there's only two being described in marine. So the potential of discovering new parasites is high. And then in freshwater, 
um, for biodiversity and aquaculture. If you can discover new parasites in the fresh water, then you can um, see if the aquaculture fish do get parasites and see if it has a risk of transferring diseases from one another. And then leeches can be um, potential in, um, vectors as they are blood sucking invertebrates that, that um, comes in marine and fresh water. So my hypothesis is the current marine fish and freshwater troponosome diversity in Southern Africa reflects the lack of reaches rather than the true diversity. Um, so my aims would be to increase the um, morphological and morphometrical and molecular characteristics um, on the troponosomes. And in order to do that, I um, will collect blood from selected marine and freshwater fish screen all the blood for triponosomes, do a morphological and morphometrical description, and also molecular characterize all the triponosomes. So the sites that, that we used um, was for marine, it was Namibia, Wolfus uh, Bay, and then it was Titicama, Sensa East, yeah, um, Bokness and Karigarafir, and then also Sudwana. And then for the freshwater, um, it was the Pepe River, Tenin, and um, Lataba River, um, Moy River, and then the olive olifant system in in the Cedarburg. But for the um, for this presentation, I will only be focusing on the results from Tetikoma, Sensa, and then Bokness and Karika River, so the marine site. So we used baited traps, rod and line fishing, and then cyanating to collect all the fish. And then once the collect the fish was collected, we I draw blood to make blood smears. Uh, to put a drop of blood on a slide to observe the, the live smears to see for the movement. And then also I uh, place a drop of blood in molecular oh, in, in um, ethanol for the genetics. Um, and then for the leeches, a third of the leeches was removed uh, with a fine brush and then placed in um, ethanol for genetics. A second third was placed in formalin for sem and hist um, histology. And then the last third was um, kept in water body to stay alive. And then as they died, submerged to and stained and looked for the life stages. So the smears and the leeches were fixed with methanol and then stained with Gimza stain. So for the measurements, um, we used the nuclear length, the nuclear width, the body width, the flagellum length, the um, nucleus to the posterior end, the nucleus to the anterior end, and then the total body length. Um, for the genetics, we use standard protocol genetics using um, copper extraction kit for extractions, then PCR using the 18S gene um, with the um, some specific primers, and then visualize it on the UV light, send it to Inquaba for sequencing. Um, this resulting sequencing received back was compared um, through sequencing that's already on gene bank, and then to construct a phylogenetic tree. So um, in the Caphrogobius nudiceps, which is the goby, the um, Shalon Richardsoni, which is the mullet, and then Cleanus superciliosus, which is the clipfish, and then Litinochus litinochus, which is the sea and brass, was the results that we got from um, all the marine fish that was caught. Um, so just to visualize the differences, it's the goby, the mullet, the, uh, the clipfish, and then the sea and brass. So as you can see here, this is the different, different, uh, positions of the nucleus. One is more to the anterior side, the other one is more to the posterior side. And also the uh, width of the nucleus is different. There you can see the kinetoplast is very bright, as in the other triponosomes, it's not as bright. Um, and then here you can see the whole shape of the triponosome differ from the one from the mullet, and also the length of the tri triponosome, the total length. Um, and then I don't know if it's as bright there, but there the membrane is very nicely, and you can see and measure that as the ones from the goby, you can't see the membrane. So that's key differences. For the morphometrics, um, so you use the NMDS by plot um, to indicate the similarities between the um, individuals in the same species, but also to see the differences um, of the species in terms of the troponosome measurements. So the stress number, the 0 0.04, is a good indication of the, the um, plotting of, of the uh, 
the measurements as it's not been manipulated or stressed too much to give me this result. Um, the closer you get to one, the less accurate the, the measurement is. So just the blue is the goby, the pink is the mullet, the yellow is the clubfish, and then the green is the stian brass. Um, so the movement, the goby one is a persistent mover. So it um, don't move as fast as the, the ones from the mullet, the tumbler, but it, uh, it um, goes in a farther distance than, than the mullet, as you can see there, the mullet is doing this. <laughs> and then um, for the Litenoches, Litenoches, which is a steambras, it's also a tumbler like the mullet. And then for the clipfish, it is an intermediate one because it's not as fast as the tumblers, but it moves the same distance as the persistent one. Um, so just for the genetics, so marine is part of the subgenus, which is the Humatomonas, and um, just to, the, the phylogenetic tree that's here is just the subgenus. So it's the fly and the crocodile on top, then it's the freshwater, then it's the turtles, the platypus, again crocodile, and then marine catfish. Um, then it is the stingray, and then there is the um, clubfish, the sharks, the stian brass, the gobies, and the mullet. And then the one between the two clipfish is actually sequenced from a leech, which is showing that a leech can be a potential in, um, vector. So just to summary today, we've collected and screened blood from marine um, sites, and then also the Tanin and Crocodile River. Um, we, I did molecular morphology on marine, and then molecular, I did the Karigarafir and the Bocnes actually all the marine sites and then um, also Limpopo sites and I'm busy and processing and publishing the article on the discovering of this four new species and then for future studies I will look at the shark troponosomes a lot more on the freshwater sites and then life cycles in leeches. So this is just the shark <laughs> blood which is cool um, and we don't know yet if it's um, same morphotypes or different morphotypes in one species or not so just the acknowledgement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time for two questions. Yeah, it's on. Um, nice talk. I uh, enjoyed that. Parasites freaked me out a little bit, but interesting anyway um how did you decide on the study sites because they are so widespread out so it was a representative of different types of environments or how were those nine different sites or ten different sites chosen yeah so it was um to include like the whole southern africa because just like you said it's different ocean types in in the marine site and then for freshwater it's also different habitat types and they've been sampling there and did find Trypanosome said, but I didn't look at it. So I went back to look at it again and see if we can do more studies on the molecular morphology on that specific site. So, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. Great talk. Um, I was wondering if there's any, um, what are the infection rates? So, example, for the out of the how many fish you sample, what are the infection rates mm. of this of, of this uh, fluke? Mm. Um, and then what are the, are there any physiological consequences on the fish yeah. if they are infected? Um, or any other health, you know, anything that, how does it actually affect the fish or is it sort of a passive yes. pathogen? Yes. So um, the, I will start with by the effect of the fish. Um, it's difficult because we don't know which fish has been infected as yet. So for now, we're just looking at what fish is infected and to see um, how broad the range is. And then after that, in future studies, we can definitely look because that's the end goal to look at what health issues it has on the fish. But as yet, I we don't know as yet what effect it will have. And then um, so... <laughs> In out of 295 fish um, in 31 species, only five as yet was infected with the trypanosomes. Um, but in the specific individual, it's the prevalence is high. It's about 15 um, trypanosomes in 0 0.1 milliliter blood. So it's quite high in the specific individual if they is infected, but we are trying to correlate it with, with the vector because if there's no vectors, then we can see like, okay, there's non-infection and the vector depends on the habitat and all that. So I hope I answer your question. No, that, that was perfect. That's yeah. quite interesting because I have read about other parasites that do actually can affect 
other organism behavior. Yes, no, definitely. So it'll be quite yes. interesting to see what the actual consequences of the infection is, especially if it's, if it's very low in the proportion. Yes. Are those individuals doing things differently to the rest of the population yes. because they're infected? And trypanosomes in like terrestrial area, it, it has an effect, so it would be nice to see. Yes, yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So we have to cut the discussion short. So uh, just a reminder to the speakers, uh, I have Sia there who's going to be helping with helping with the timekeeping. She has a two minute board and a one minute board. And once you see me stand up, that means you have 10 seconds. So yes, yeah, keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, so the next speaker is Vivian Danes and she'll be talking about how Port Mura is clearly artificial and yet a totally surprising uh, sanctuary for fish. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be telling you the story about the work we've been doing in Port Mucho, which forms part of my PhD as well. And it really is quite a surprising story. So man-made seascapes, which I'm sure we're going to hear plenty about today, are these clearly artificial uh, infrastructure that we put in our coastlines and used to protect our cities and facilitate trade. And as the human population grows, so does the concrete in the ocean. Um, and this obviously comes with a range of impacts on the marine environment because you're replacing a natural environment with a fake one. Um, there's been quite a lot of work done, especially on benthos, um, reduction of ecosystem services, and it led to this whole uprising of eco-engineering, which we'll also hear lots about today, so I'm not going to go too in-depth. But one thing that comes up in all this research is what about the mobile organisms like fish and sharks and rays? Um, how do they get displaced or how do they come into these new habitats, um, given that they actually have the opportunity to stay versus leave? So Port Gucha, which is my study site, um, is South Africa's largest port, but it's also our newest port. It was dredged out from the Kucha estuary, which was a small and ephemeral estuary. And it was started in 2006 and com uh, well, complete in 2006 and actually got its first ship in 2009. Its break walls are quite impressive, being 1.3 and 2.7 kilometers long. And one of my favorite facts is that it was built out of 26,530 ton dolosa, individually placed by crane based on computer simulation. And then also we can see that there's quite a few different microhabitats that if we pay close attention. So we have vertical key walls, we have dolosa, we have a beautiful sandy beach in the back, which features prominently in our research, shallow profile reefs, um, and all of these come together to make little microhabitats. But the security in port with Transnet is actually quite well managed and, and it's pretty tight. So access into the port is quite difficult and uh, definitely not for fishing unless it's for research purposes. So here's a little timeline, which really nicely shows how this little ephemeral issue, which still had the salt pans at that time, in the 1980s, all of a sudden spews into this massive harbor and around it, we get the sprawl of an industrial development zone um, and its completion in 2009. And how in 2016, we had the addition of the small craft harbor in the back of the beach there, which actually did change quite a bit with the dynamics of that beach habitat. So yeah, it's just impressive to see such a feat of engineering go up so quickly. So along came Professor Dickin, who's my one supervisor, and he utilized this opportunity to start the long-term fish biomonitoring program, which is basically a tagging project um, from 2006 to 2009, which is a beautiful data set because it's pre-operational but post-completion. And it was really differing from other tagging projects in that we had a close-knit group of uh, local anglers working while well, fishing around the year, so 365, 24, seven, based on the availabilities, with the plain goal of try catch as many bloody things as possible. And it really um, highlighted some interesting things. We were having lots of new species coming in and new patterns. Like for instance, recently, we've been seeing a lot of new patterns with tuna species coming in and march after bait fish and um, these impressive aggregations of sharks and rays that we get every year around the clock. So really, really seeing some cool species coming in. So the long-term data set that we can get from all this data, we can see it in the Excel sheets and in real life. So this picture is from the port where we have these impressive aggregations every summer of um, sharks and rays being the most prominent smooth hounds. Um, to date, we have 11,753 cat records, 6,000 have been tagged, 700 were uh, recaptured externally with an impressive 500 being in recaptured internally. So high, high return or high residency. Um, what's also quite cool is that this 
the top of the food chain is quite prevalent with 32.8% of our catches being elasmobranchs. So altogether, anglers have fished 834 days, 6,200 odd hours of effort and only 49 no catch days, which is quite impressive. Um, and quite a standardized team of 22 anglers with 10 currently still active. So just to look at the previous studies, Professor Dickens looked at the importance of this port as a nursery ground for the juvenile dusky or gray sharks, as we call them, and found that there was it was actually a very important site for early juveniles and young neonates, which previously at that time, we thought that Protea Banks and Northern KZN were their most important nursery ground. But clearly, it's very important for juveniles here in Port Elizabeth as well. And in 2010, he looked at a biodiversity study of the data up to that point, of which there was 47 species. And at the moment, our catch records have 76 species. So we still have quite an interesting mix in the top catches of these estuarine species. And we have some you know, reef associated species mixing with all these sharks and rays. And then we also have quite a few interesting visitors that pop in every now and then. And here is a video of our smooth island aggregations, which happens every January and February, and they never miss a beat. And very impressively, only 3.2% of our smooth island catches at this time of the year have been male. So most of these um, smooth islands are pregnant females. So this led the question as to why it's such an important place for these aggregations and why we're seeing such weird and wonderful species popping in um, because fishing only tells you a certain part of the story. So we use stereo... Um, um, beta remote underwater videos and we've been sampling around the clock and we've built up quite an extensive uh, data set from that basically to describe the fish at the community level and also look at the description discrepancies of what we're seeing from the brav footage versus what we're seeing from the catch data and the list is endless of what we're seeing in the bravs but not seeing in the catch data and then also to look at mapping out the port and using the um, various techniques such as triangular irregular, irregular networking to work out detailed levels of habitat complexity because this is really important for advising future developments um, such as um, what are your important levels of habitat complexity for supporting fish communities for future harbor developments. Um, nursery function, which is pretty easy to pick up on the stereo bravs, and then also what's leading these communities to change in terms of the short term, such as upwelling, red tides in the bay, um, and also we can look at the long term data set to get a more idea of how over long term the communities have changed um, and colonized. Oh, I already have one minute. I was rushing there for a second. Um, but anyway, this has been an extensive work. And if it wasn't for the great relationship formed with Transnet um, and a whole bunch of um, services provided by SIAB, this work would not have been possible. So I would really like to thank all our funders and everything. And there's uh, some videos of some of our cool visitors. Anyway, questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, we have time for just one question, a quick question. Thank you for that interesting talk. I'd just like to know, what is the water quality like? And oh. are these guys trying to avoid other anglers? Or is there any explanation beyond habitat complexity? Oh, what do you mean these guys are trying to avoid other anglers? Just the fish aggregate the... the oh, 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 okay. The sanctuary purpose. Um, so water clarity is pretty good in summer. Um, when our water temperature reaches around 22 degrees, we usually have crystal clean water. In winter, we do struggle quite a bit with the sun angle. We did a lot of pilot testing. If the sun is not high enough, you get this algal layer that sits at the bottom. Um, so we almost have to wait for the algal layer to rise a little. And then you get, you know, medium but not great visibility. It's pretty much like working in Tsitsikama. But most of the time, like as you can see in this example, oh, I can see it, but it is crystal clean. So you just have to time it perfectly. And in terms of why we're getting them and not um, outside, it's almost, it is treated like a sanctuary because there's, even though you have a container ship coming in now and then, the pressure on the fish communities themselves is very low. So it's almost like an MPA. And we're right adjacent to the Addo MPAs, which has Jehiel Island and St. Croix. So I'm pretty sure there's some sort of seeding population happening there. So, um, but also it's warm water, it's food availability all the time. It's always sheltered. So I think that's why fish have established themselves so nicely in the port. 
I think you can discuss after. Sorry. Time. You're trying to catch up. <laughs> Thank you. Remember, our speakers will always be around for tea to catch up. So, yeah, we're moving on to the next speaker and we're now moving back on land. And uh, the next speaker is Nawa Nawa, who's going to be speaking about the assessment of the multi species Barutse floodplain fishery of the Upper Zambezi system. Good morning. Um... Today, my presentation is on assessment of the mud species, Baros floodland fishery of the Upper Zambezi. The Baros floodplain is one of the big wetlands in the Zambezi Basin, specifically located in the Upper Zambezi. It is uh, it supports most uh, multi species uh, Adzano fishery, which is important source of uh, food and income to the resident community in the area. The fishery uses a wide range of fishing methods. Uh, it combines uh, traditional and uh, uh, modern fishing methods. Over the years, the fishery has been subjected to uh, increase over exploitation and introduction of non-native species, such as uh, red crow crayfish, also known as uh, Cherax quadricarinatus. Um, unfortunately, the fishery has not been consistently assessed the last assessment of the fishery was conducted in 2014, which is almost seven years to this study. Uh, as, as, as a result, the current status of the fishery uh, is not known. Um, it is for this reason that uh, we decided to do this study. The, the objectives of the study was to conduct, um, to determine catch per unit effort across season and strata uh, in order to quantify annual fish yield, which will then be compared to historical uh, yields. The second objective was to uh, assess whether uh, fish spe uh, species composition would differ across season and strata. And if uh, five of the species harvested uh, would have their um, length at maturity uh, um, below the 50% length at maturity. Uh, the third one was the uh, objective was to assess if fishing method uh, as well as use of illegal fishing gear would differ across season and strata. And lastly, to assess if uh, the crayfish, which has been introduced in the area, would form part of the catch, and if so, whether it would be uh, higher in dry season than wet season, uh, and also whether it would be higher at the evasion core compared to the edges um, in Senanga and Lukulu uh, downstream and uh, upstream respectively. For data collection purposes, we used a fishery dependent survey, specifically the roving crew survey, uh, which were conducted biannually, uh, targeting the low and high water period. During the survey, electronic based uh, questionnaire were administered to fishers who were fishing or those returning from fishing on the landing site or in the villages. Uh, the fish that was caught by the fishers was uh, sorted out uh, according to species group or species, and then uh, weight and uh, the length uh, measured. For data analysis, um, catch per unit effort was expressed as the amount of fish caught in kg by each fisher per day. A generalized linear model were used to assess the differences in catch rates uh, according to season and strata. Uh, total yield was uh, calculated by upscaling the catch rates uh, based on effort as well as the total population of fish in the in the area, species composition was expressed as the percentage of uh, the, uh, the total fish um, as uh, in cages. And the chi square tests were used to assess gear usage and uh, crayfish uh, bycatch. According to the result, the catch rate was uh, higher in wet season and highest in Senanga, which is a downstream of the study area. Uh, the total yield calculated was uh, 3,000 metric tons, which is almost half um, half the, the, the yield that was determined uh, previous, which is about seven years ago. Uh, species were not different across season and strata. The three commonly harvested species were the carrier species, 
uh, robbers and uh, uh, Rendali, uh, which uh, show a change in terms of um, uh, in terms of the composition of species previously. There was also Oreochromis niloticus, which was um, found, and this provides uh, this actually is the first official record of the uh, non-native species in the fishery. Um, in terms of size structuring, uh, four of the harvested species had their length at, uh, um, had their mean length lower than the length at fifty percent maturity, uh, indicating overexploitation. Uh, the four species were Captodon rindali, uh, Oreochromis adesoni, um, Hydrocyanus vitatus, and uh, Scilby depressor ritris. Gear usage, uh, gear usage was also not different across season and strata. There the were three commonly harvested, uh, three commonly used uh, fishing methods were gill nets, hook and line, and uh, say net. Of course, there are other fishing methods you can see in, uh, in the table. In terms of uh, gear usage, uh, um, illegal fishing methods, um, gill nets, 90% of the gillnets that are used are below the um, three inches in terms of mesh size, which is legally allowed. And also uh, illegal usage was higher downstream in Senanga compared to the other two strata. Also use of monofilament, monofilament gillnet, which is prohibited. Uh, majority of the, the fishers are using it. Uh, and also is higher in uh, downstream in Senanga compared to the other strata in Mungo and uh, Lukulu. It's also higher uh, in uh, wet season compared to uh, dry season. Uh, crayfish is also being caught by the fishers. Uh, almost 74% of the fishers are now catching crayfish in their uh, fishing gear. Uh, and it's also higher at the evasion core where it was initially introduced and also uh, higher in uh, dry season. All fisheries indicators show that the fishery is overexploited. Uh, the catch rates, species composition, uh, size structure, use of illegal fishing method also show uh, all show that there is uh, overexploited in the uh, overexploitation in the fishery. The presence of Oreochromis niloticus and the Chirax quadrica inatas um, also pose a, th a threat to the fishery through uh, potential loss of um, uh, genetic resource as well as increased cost to uh, the fishery. So they, they, there is need for effective management of the fishery to ensure sustainability of fishery resources as well as conservation of, uh, of biodiversity. I've come to the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank my supervisors and funders. Thank you now for an interesting talk. Uh, we have time for two questions. Thanks, Nava. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there any uh, way of um, controlling the type of netting? You, you mentioned quite a few uses of illegal netting. Is there any um, policing of, of that, if you can call it like 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 that? It can can are there of officers that check um, if if people are using uh, the right uh, gears or not, or is it not really very much controlled? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, actually um, the the regulations and the law, uh, fishery laws are there. The, I think the biggest problem in the fishery has been enforcement um, because of the politics that is there between, because these are rural areas and ma a major source of livelihood to the people in the in the area. So the politics uh, of uh, trying to, uh, you know, conserve the resources, um, th that is, I think, uh, has been the major, major problem. And we see uh, mostly they, they tend to be relaxed um, and they're trying to avoid the confrontation. Uh, and so I think that's that's really the bigger the bigger problem in the in the area. Okay, th thanks now. Um, nice talk. Um, yeah, this is just a, just, just a follow-up to Francesca's question. So why is it that um, 
illegal activities are more prevalent in the southern part of the of the flood plain compared to the you know to the upper reaches. And then secondly, is crayfish being utilized by the local communities? Thanks. Okay. Um, I think in terms of uh, prevalence of um, illegal fishing uh, method uh, downstream, uh, I think the main reason is accessibility to, uh, I think, uh, the, the illegal fishing gears. Uh, it, it looks like the, the people down there are near to the markets where these illegal fishing uh, ma uh, materials are, are found. Um, I think that could be the, that's the main reason I would, I would think of. Um, in terms of the crayfish itself, Yes, um, no, not yet. Um, actually, at, at the moment, I haven't come across any local people that are, you know, eating this or selling it anywhere. But uh, we've seen in other invasions elsewhere that uh, people have slowly begun to uh, start eating those. And so I think those are some of the things that we'll have to look at in terms of uh, managing the, the, the crayfish going forward. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you now for the interesting talk. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, Dolana Chokwane. Uh, she will be speaking on reassessing the species limits within the lower field large scale yellowfish, Labiobalbus maroquensis, from Southern Africa. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tulwana, and I'll be speaking on reassessing species limits within labor powers maracuensis. Sorry. So labor powers are the largest cyprinid fish in Southern Africa, and a cariological study showed that they're hexaploid species, which means they have six sets of chromosomes. Labor powers are popular angling species and through this popularity, a, not, a number of fish communities have been established to feed the local communities which depend on them. Lebebabas have highly variable mouth forms, ranging from a typical lab, lab mouth form as seen in A to a var mouth form with a cutting edge as seen in F. This mouth phenotypic variation has been associated with the complex taxonomic history of this group of fishes. This mouth complexity has been evident in the species I will talk to, which is Lebebabas maracuensis. Before I get to the species, uh, Lebebabas was previously, there was previously called Lebebabas and Varicunas. But however, so after molecular work, it was shown that Varicunas uh, could be synonymized with Lebebabas. This was also followed by morphological study by Fervent that showed that solidified the synonymization of these two genera. Sorry. Okay, sorry. The mouth complex associated with labial powers is evident in Maroquensis. This is evident in that there are 14 synonyms of labial powers Maroquensis. Um, the Limpopo Basin has the highest number of synonyms, which are the first four fish species. So it could be Vericonus brucei and Vericonus uh, olifanti as an example. The Zambezi River system was also, also has a number of synonyms of Lebepavas maracuensis, which are Lebepavas nasutas, rhodensis, and such. Uh, in the Nkomati, only one species was described, and what it was called Lebepabas sabiensis. Okay. Previously, the species, as they were described by the different um, collectors, they were described because of their different mouth types. So in A, we see the rubber leaf mouth forms, which was described in the Limpopo River as Lebepabas brucei. But also in the Limpopo River system, the Lebepavas olifanti was described with a var mouth form, which has a cutting edge and no median lobe. Lebepavas maracuensis itself is shown to be an intermediate mouth form. Sorry. 
So in our study, we used integrative taxonomic approach because we saw that it is helping to shed more light in the yellow fishes. This was first shown by Bloomer, who used a multidisciplinary approach to study the Lebebabas of the Orange River, namely Lebebabas kimaliensis and Lebebabas inius. However, he, she saw that there was modern, moderate genetic diversity. Also, using an integrative mo molecular and mo genetic approach, Ferron showed that the lab and var forms in the Nkisi and Congo, Congo River basin represented two distinct species. This resulted in, this, in us thinking that the Lebebabas mariquensis, which is distributed from the Zambezi to the Pongola River, might actually be a, a complex species. So the aim of the study is to use an integrative taxonomic approach to explore and document the degree of hidden species diversity within Lebiopawas mariquensis. So we used uh, specimens that were collected since 1911 from the collection in the SIA facilities. And we also collected uh, got tissue samples from the same database. For morphological assessment, we used the mouth scoring um, technique that was developed by Ferven, and we measured the 14 body meristics and body morphometrics. The integrative approach of using CO1 and morphological and meristic analysis showed that the Lebepabas Americans complex was actually a complex of four lineages. The, the Limpopo complex, the Pongola complex, which included the Incomati system, the Pongola and the Pongola, the Pongola system and the Mbuluzi system. We also had a lineage in the Zambezi River and a lineage in the Pungwe River. The support for the lineage of the Pungwe River was high, which had a bootstrap of 96%. Uh, so we carried on to do the morphological analysis to try and determine if there are any characteristics which we can differentiate the species. In the Zambezi lineage, in the Zambezi lineage, we found that the number of pre-dorsal pre scales and the number of scales between the caudal and dorsal fin could distinguish the Lebebabas from the Zambezi river systems with from the Lebebabas from the Limpopo and the Pungwe river system. While in the labiopowers from the Punga system, they were distinguished from all the other labiopowers, Marikwensis complex species, by the number of lateral scales and also the number of dorsa and caudal fin. So in our study, we saw that morphological and molecular data showed that labiopowers Marikwensis is not a single widely distributed species as we previously it, as it was previously thought, and it actually has four candidate species. But in the case of the Lebebabas from the Pongola, Nkomat, and Limpopo system, the genetic distinction was not that high, and we could not as yet find morphological differences. So the conservative decision was to keep them as one species. However, the results from the Zambezi River system support that this lineages should be uh, revalidated because as a previous species was described and the Pungwe River lineage should be described as a new species. Thank you. Thank you, Tolana. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Hi, Tolana. I would like to know if what, what strategy did you use to select your river systems? Okay, so the river systems are, we selected all the river system that labor powers Marikwensis is known to be distributed across. Thank you very much, Tolana, for the talk.
So our next speaker is Nicole, and she'll be presenting on the ecotoxicological responses of the African turquoise uh, killifish nodobranchus fraziri to chemical and biological stresses. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I will, be, I will be presenting on my PhD project proposal. My main supervisor for the project is Professor Nico Smith, and my co-supervisors are Profs Victor Vyapunar and Luke Brendonk, as well as Dr. Eli Thor. So just a brief introduction. Northobranchus vizuri, also known as Enfizuri, is a key keystone species within temporary pools. And they are a suitable ecotoxological vertebrate model as they exhibit rapid growth rates and produce drought resistant eggs. Their habitats, which are temporary pools, can act as sinks for contaminants, which can negatively affect the ecosystems. However, contaminants aren't the only factor as climate change can have the same deleterious effects. So the hypothesis for the study is that the local adaptation to the hydrology of temporary pools along an aridity of gradients will influence the parasite diversity and sensitivity to pollutants such as pesticides of Northobranchus fissuri. So what are the aims and objectives? What, are we, what do we want to do within this PhD? So our first aim is to determine the relationship between pond hydrology and parasite diversity. In order to do this, we need to, we need to obtain wild caught in fissuri, and we will do this using 10 millimeter fike nets. The fish will then be subjected to endoparasitic and ectoparasitic assessments, in which for endoparasitic, the muscle and internal organs will be, sorry, will be uh, located. And for ectoparasitic, the scale, eyes, gills, and operculum, as well as fins will also be located. They will then be viewed under a microscope and then they will be genetically and morphologically characterized. So our second aim is to determine the inorganic and organic levels of in the temporary pools. So in order to do this, we will have to obtain water, sediment, as well as the tissues of infusory. And based on the different contaminants present, be it pesticides or metals, there are different methods for collection and, and storage. We will then have to analyze the water sediment and the tissues. And again, based on the contaminant present, there are different um, methods of analysis. So for pesticides, you can use the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry or the gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And for metals, you use the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or the atomic absorption spectrometry. So our third aim is to determine the sensitivity, dif the sensitivity differences. So in order to do this, we will have to um, run a comparison study using uh, bioassays. So we will use the wild caught infusory as well as the lab reared or the lab strain of infusory, which is known as the gonorrhea zoo strain, also GRZ. And then we will compare it to the more commonly used uh, vertebrate model, which is Dania rara, also known as zebrafish. So we will determine the LC50 concentration, which is the lethal concentration to kill 50% of the organisms. And based on these results, we'll be looking at the embryo activity, the malformations, the lethality, the hatching success, the oxygen, oxygen consumption, as well as the uptake. From this, we will then utilize the adverse outcome pathway construct. And with this, we'll be using the LC10 and LC20 concentrations, which, is also, which can also be the 10% and 20% of the LC50 concentration. So from this, the fish will be subjected to the stressor in which it will give rise to a molecular initiating event. And from this molecular initiating event, it'll give rise to various key events that can, that can then lead to an adverse outcome. So just an example of what we'll be looking at. So for the MIE, we'll be looking at metabolomics in which we will then store the samples. After exposure, we'll store the samples at minus 80 and send it off for analysis. And from this MIE, we can look at the various key events such as oxygen and behavior. So to determine oxygen, we'll look at the loligo, we'll place the fish in the loligo mice, uh, microplate or the respirometer chamber and measure the oxygen consumption. And for behavior, we'll be looking at the swimming behavior. For heart rate, we can use the tap and count method in which we record the video for, uh, for 10 seconds and slow it down all the way and play it back and then tap along with the heartbeat with a pen and paper. Then for blood flow, we're gonna use the record and follow method in which we, in which we follow the same point on the tail of the fish and then we record it and analyze it using um, danioscope. 
So various out adverse outcomes that can be looked at is growth and fecundity. So for growth, we will use the morphometrics, which is the weight and the size of the fish. And then for fecundity, we'll be looking at spawning behavior. So aim for is to determine the relationship between pond hydrology, brain size, as well as behaviors. So in order to do this, we will obtain the wild caught infusory as well as the lab strain, GRZ strain. And then we will then characterize the killifish behavior using a multitude of tests, such as predator avoidance, the mirror test, the open field assays, emergent test, as well as the maze test. There's also another test, which is a choice chamber te test, in which you place the fish in the middle of two containers in which you alter the parameters, and then you see which um, container the fish will choose. So our fifth aim is to determine the parasite infestation on the behavior of the killifish. So what is already known on the parasite infestation on the killifish behavior is that it, there is a patamon species which affects the, which is located in the cerebral cavity of the killifish. And this is going to affect its behavior by causing it to swim closer to the water surface. And can, they can even cause the killifish to jump out of the water onto lily pads to, um, for ease of visualization for avian predators so that the parasite can complete its life cycle. So in order to do this, we will obtain culture and effect. So for this, we will have the F0 generation and culture it to produce an F1 generation to ensure it's purged from parasites. Then we will obtain the vector, which will be, um, sorry, which will be obtained from the concurrently running PhD zoology project. And then we, we will get it, we will get the Sakaria that's shed from the snail and then with then infect the killifish with a known parasite load. Then we will then characterize the killifish's behavior using various behavioral tests as mentioned in AIM-4. And then after this behavioral exposure, we will then dissect the brain to determine the size of the brain as well as the parasite load. Our sixth aim is the mesocosm study. So for this, we will set up a mesocosm to mimic the natural habitat of infusory by the addition of plants, zooplankton, macroinvertebrates, algae, and fairy shrimp. And then we will then alter the parameters by the addition of a chemical stressor and a biological stressor. We will then sample the water sediments, micro and macroinvertebrates, phytoplankton, and determine leaf litter composition, decomposition, as well as obtaining the killifish tissue samples. And this is to determine the effect that it has on the ecological system. So for statistical analysis, there are relevant uni and multivariate analysis that we will conduct utilizing GraphPad Prism, Konoko, as well as Metaba Analyst. So just a brief timeline of what we've done and where we're going. So what's already been completed is the proposal, the ethics, and I've completed the killifish training in Belgium in which we went through the husbandry of the killifish as well as dissection. We are now here at the NRF Student Symposium and going forward for 2024, we will be doing the sampling, laboratory exposures, as well as field-based exposures. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation with a lot of interesting concepts. Uh, we have time for two questions, uh, or rather input, since this is a proposal. Anyone has input? Yeah. That was really interesting and um it's a massive it seems like it's a huge phd so just keep that in mind if you're able to accomplish all those things incredible but don't beat yourself up if you don't manage to accomplish all the things because lab-based work can always go wrong yes. i know at least with the killifish it's uh aquaculture species or uh, aquarium species yes. so at least i think there are is a lot of information on how to maintain these animals and everything but it's it's just a big project, so good luck. Thank I hope you. it all goes according to plan, Thank but you. really interesting work. Thank you. Cool, yeah. Um, go with T, very good talk. Yeah. Um, I was just curious on how prevalent the wild, like how easy it is to get individuals in the wild. And I, you probably did say it in your talk, but I missed it. Um, where are you planning on sampling the, the wild population? And um, okay. are, are you confident? I mean... Is there only a problem if you have a very dry year and there are no femoral pans that you don't get the fish coming up Okay, you hatch them? Yeah. All right. So uh, we are planning to sample in February. So it is the wet season so that the, uh, the pools will be filled. And we are planning to sample inside and outside the Karangani Game Reserve. It's in Mozambique. Yes. And sorry, what was the other question? No, oh, the... Uh, yes. 
Sorry, if it was a bad rainy season and you didn't get, I suppose then you can just use the, you're just going to have to make do with the. Yes, um, we're going to have to make the, do. The, 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 <laughs> so there, there are various pools in which we will then have to look at as well, but the sites will remain the same. I was just wondering whether you could take a water tank and fill a few pools up and wait a few months and <laughs> see if any come up. Good plan, good plan. I'll note that down. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk again. Uh, so we are now changing gears again. Our next speaker is going to actually introduce us to the plants moving away from the fish and all the other live things and moving to the <laughs> different kingdom totally. So the next speaker is uh, Violetu and she'll be talking on the distribution, abundance and habitat characteristics of Cyprus textiles. Morning, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Velo Tumko. I'm doing my PhD um, with Nelson Mandela University, but I'm based at the SIEB. Um, So today I'll be giving you insights on the distribution, abundance, and habitat characteristics of Cyprus textiles. Um, so this, the project is supervised by Janine Adams from NMU, um, with Francesca Pori from SIEB, and um, Rachel Weinberg from UCT. So this image just reminded me of my project. Uh, so the project has three experts, um, a botanist, a marine um, ecologist, and also a social scientist with um, members of the Case Gamma Trust in Hamburg community. Um, I'm the driver of the project, but um, ignore the fact that the text is struggling to move. I think that's how we're all feeling as PhD students. <laughs> But um, this project is part of the Big Imis project, which is trying to address the problems associated with urbanization by creating these nature-based structures using this, the plant known as Cyberus textilis, which I'll be talking more about later on. But what we, we're trying to do is to make these woven mats from the plant, and these are put in ports and harbors for the hope is that the small aquatic animals will use these as refuge, necessary, and for attachment. So um, the, the project has a potential of being scaled up. So this is where my project comes in. I'm trying to find sustainable ways of harvesting and cultivating the plant material. So for me to do that, I need to know the distribution, abundance, and um, habitat characteristics of the plant. And then I also need to be able to domesticate the plant. So I'll be doing that using three techniques. That is planting it in soil, um, using hydroponics, and also in aquaponics. Um, because the weaving skill that is making the nature-based structures is um, a very important skill and is um, only specialized people know it, that is the, the, the case gamma people. So I'll be in, um, engaging with the community of the Hamburg, trying to understand the uses of the plant, and also how they, they harvest and also cultivate the plant. So this is basically my PhD in one slide. But for the sake of the presentation, I'll focus on the first data chapter, that is the distribution, abundance, and habitat characteristics of the plant. So just a brief break, um, introduction to the plant. The plant is commonly known as the Met Sedge. Um, in the Eastern Cape, it is locally known as Imizi. It belongs to the family Cyberisi. It is endemic to South Africa. Um, it's mostly found in river banks, streams, dams, pools, and marshes. And under the IUCN red list, it's listed under um, list concern. And in the Eastern Cape, it is the most utilized um, plant material used for original crafts, making um, sleeping mats, amakuko, um, and also fruit baskets. I'm sure you've seen those. So um, early work that was conducted on the plant focused mainly on the societal and economic importance of the plant. Um, but um, there's limited information focusing on domesticating the plant, especially for nature-based um, engineering applications. So as I mentioned that I'll be focusing on this chapter. So we wanted to determine the distribution, abundance, and habitat characteristics of Cyprus textiles. 
And our hypothesis is that cyberistic stilis occurring in coastal areas will be different from cyberistic stilis occurring in inland areas. And what we did was to um, obtain sightings of the plant from our naturalist and the, the sun bee, the herbariums, and we combined those just to provide guidance of where the plant occurs around um, the Eastern Cape. So we found we found 140 sightings, and we what we've been doing is to do field surveys to look for the plant. So there were 62 sites around Makanda, which we identify as inland, and we managed to, to visit 42. But from the 42, we sampled 12, because it depended on how much of the plant is there. So when we get to this each site, the ones that we sample, we will identify randomly the five quadrants. In each quadrant, we measure the plant height, come density, which is the number of stems per quadrant, percentage cover, and patch size. From the same quadrant, we also measure the moisture content, um, organic matter, particle size, and salinity. So this is just general description of the site that we visited. So the tree canopies in, um, in sites, they range from open, semi, open to closed. The most co-occurrences with the Cypress textiles were Typha capensis, Fragmentis australis, and Acacia species. So the, the patches also differed. Um, some were sparse, some were continuous along the river banks. And, um, they grow near water's edge flowing streams. Those that were submerged in water were shorter and less robust than those that were on the sides of the rivers. And we also noticed that they grew taller in semi-open canopies than open canopies. And we, we hypothesized that it, it, they, are, they are competing for light. And we did some analysis. Um, looking for differences among the sites and locations. And we basically we're looking differences among calm density, which is the stems, the shoots, which is the new babies that are growing and also percentage cover and um, <laughs> okay, I don't see. But it was basically and pest size, yes. So there were no significant differences when it comes to plant height and percentage cover, but there were differences in count density and shoot. So we further investigated that. And um, so far, these are the results we have for organic matter. So you can see the, there's lots of differences among the locations and also when it comes to moisture content. So um, what next? So we will sample the of Fred Humberg towards East London um, site, which is the coastal side, and we will do say similar analysis and compare the two, the inland and the coastal. Um, I'd like to thank my team, my NRF funding side for housing me, and my supervisors and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Vio, for the talk. I think they have uh, enough for two questions for Vio. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Okay, whilst she was, I was just wondering, why, why, why Imizi? I'm sure there are other, like, why not the other the phragmites or other plants? Why Imizi? It's, it's the most um, used for crafting material. So they prefer, the, the women and in the villages, they prefer using it. It's not really a question, more just a, a comment. I guess this is so different from your master's. It is. It's a really cool project. Thank um, you. And it's, it's more just that first slide that you had up with essentially your PhD in summary. I think that that's something that everybody could really take note of. It's a really nice clear overview of what your whole project was. So it was more comment on, I really like that. I like that it had impact and what the, the goals of the project were, so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vio. Uh, yeah, at each conference, there's always that one person who does something very different from everyone else. And that person is Matsubani for this conference and he'll be coming to present, uh, I think it's a poem for us.
Hi, hi, Dr. Ant. <laughs> um, so please don't boo me off stage. I've only presented this once and it was quite good. I guess today is the day I find out whether those guys are being nice or not. <laughs> um, so it's tight. This poem is titled Thoughts Staring into the Horizon. Mr. Sun looking all suave with the rhythmic strikes of warmth and light, ample with no limits when it's time to give the taste of death at the crest of your gamma rays lingers. Kneeling at the bottom skies a choice of bread or stone, but these intricacies are unraveled and secrets to life given by the sky untangled. Look at how the packets of light plummet in waves as the skies allow. Light as air, her love for you and I remains unsaid. Now it strikes her blued face. See how her skin flows in her swell, her eyes in full of rifting waters that drop with a tap against her brown grained hips. How her raging arms sift the waters and her flabby arms shake the walls and boundaries crossed when she stands on her feet holding back what she houses. Bite for bite, our greed leads us to the next. Look how we gather into our arms, how we clench her fruit. She said to my greatest of grandmothers, pieces of me are pieces of you, purified air not charred, fruit that trail from the coast to the deepest depths in the heart of my hearts. How we've tried to wring her dry, but like water she moves, replenished, revitalized, only for you and I to know for sure she lives on, way beyond the shores and bordered skies. And still we rise to chase, even when she withers and falls, all she needs is extending love, stretching beyond her walls, you and I hand in hand in light of day with order to border her heart of hearts. Thank you very much, uh, Masabane. I think it's the first time I've had a poem at a conference, but awesome. <laughs> so yeah, now uh, it's your turn as the audience to also stretch your mental strings and exercise your brains and to do that, we have Wuyo uh, leading us uh, in a plicker session. So I think all of you guys got those little papers with the square things that look like QR codes. Bring them out. Okay, while well, you're setting up, I'll just take you through the rules of the game. So you you, you all have like the black diagram in front of you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in the diagram, there's numbers. The number is your ID, so we know which clicker card you have. And the alphabets are your options from a multiple choice question. So when you make your option, um, you choose your option, you take your plicker card and the, the, the letter that you're choosing must be on top, just make sure it's on top. And then I will scan through the room and your name should appear on the screen and it must be blue if I've scanned your thinking. So can we do a demonstration? That's... <laughs> <laughs> you're not chosen this one. Remove that. Yeah, yeah. Can you share our screen, please? Okay. Unseal it. Unseal it. You don't reveal read the question. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. I'm um, what? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What but does the sci yeah. <laughs> What does the sci uh, acronym stand for? A. J. B. Smith. B. South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. C. South American Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. D. South Afri South African Environmental Observation Network. The lights.
So as soon as your name turns blue, we've recorded your answer. Are we good to go? Okay. I'll be so disappointed if some of you got this wrong. The correct answer is B. Um, so yeah, everyone got this answer wrong. So yeah, no, no. <laughs> Someone chose C <laughs> and D. <laughs> okay, let's start. Yeah. So we'll start with the actual session now. Um, that was just um for a demonstration. So first question, what is the title of the talk given by our first keynote speaker, Professor Christoph O? Sorry, it went back. Um, Vuyo? It went back to the original thingy bit. Try again. Um, so A, life and nature, B, life and science, C, life sciences, um, D, biology. Can I speak? You don't have... Oh, sorry. Okay. Just let me know if your name is not turning blue and I'm first. Um, Teddy, why hasn't we captured? I think we can reveal the answer. Um, the correct answer is A. <laughs> wow, sorry, the correct answer. <laughs> Someone got this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Someone um chose the right answer, but the right answer is B. Life in science. So, <laughs> round of applause to everyone who got that right. <laughs> the mess. <laughs> Next question. Where's the next question? Um, second question, which artificial or man-made structure was built in 2006 and unexpectedly became a sanctuary for fish? A, Port Alfred Marina, B, Naisna Estuary, C, Port of Nuha, D, Algoa Bay. I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your hands. Okay, you can reveal the answer. The correct answer is C, Port of Mucha. Show the graph. Oh, show graph. That's Most cool. people got that right. <laughs> That's good. Next question, please. Um, third question, how many nominal species of Labiobabas were previously described from Southern Africa? A, 63, <laughs> B, 9, C, 21, D, 
47. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, a hint, this was part of um, Cholona's um, presentation. Okay. okay. Um, the correct answer is D forty seven. <laughs> Most people got that right as well. <laughs> Next question here. Um, this student's project involved collecting blood samples for 379 um, host fishes across the one species in various locations, including Quinza East and Bognes. The answer A, Shandra Liru, B, Vuyoda Tunko, C, Tembelisha Njovu, um, D, Vivian Damas. Um, while we get our team to remove that, what do you think the answer is, guys? Yeah. That's the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> and most of you got it right as well. This is the last one. Um, now down to our last question for this session. Um, this plant is one of the main plants used for crafts in Eastern Cape and may be ex exploited, exploited, overexploited due to its potential for large scale application. A. <laughs> Typha capensis. B. Cyperus textilis. Um, C. Okay. Yeah. That. <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so the correct answer is B, Cyprus texting this. And everyone did it correct. No, except for one person. Yeah. Yeah. Except for one. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Can we just join us for coffee break? Uh, we're bringing, we're coming back at 11 o'clock and you see we sharp so 11. So just have your coffee, have your snacks and come back by 11. Thank you. Thank you.